So yeah, so it wasn't Berlin, it was Brussels. So I gave this presentation last week in, in, in Brussels at URI, and it's a, it was a plenary talk. So it's not, I haven't pitched it at the level of um, uh, kind of craft. So it, it, it's kind of quite conceptual and stuff like that, but I hope it's still relevant, and I hope it's still interesting, and that you guys will enjoy it. So let's see if this can work. is called Sunset Coming On and there's something that uh, happens at the transition uh, of twilight leaving daytime and moving into nighttime, kind of a transition space where as human beings um, we, we have this sense of anxiety, this kind of this strange feeling of, of we're, we're creatures of the day and going into night there's a kind of a, a fear of predators that operate at nighttime and things like that and there's this, in this transition moment there's the emotion that, that is evoked is, um, is, a, is a kind of an emotion that, that you feel to be coming from some kind of liminal space, some kind of space of in-between, being in-between things. So, as was mentioned, I've, uh, I, I've lived overseas quite a lot. My, my, my mother's in Namibia and my father's uh, from the UK. And so I have, um, I've got dual nationality, um, a British passport and a South African passport. And I've lived back and forth my whole life, and I've, I've often had this weird feeling of, of you know, where do I belong? Um, the, the term for it, um, the technical term for it, is soapil. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's, it's, uh, it's a... I don't like to think of it as a derogatory term. Um, for, for English people uh, uh, living in South Africa, where you've got one foot in South Africa and one foot in the UK, and... Um, and then something hangs in the ocean, which is called a soap bill. But this thing about being between worlds is, 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 is an issue. And, and it's an issue for people that have dual nationality because it's kind of, well, I've always got my out. You know, if South Africa goes to the dogs, well, I can fuck off. You know, you know, where, you know, when do you commit and things like this? It puts you in a kind of a liminal space. My nick for as long as I can remember online has been JHO1, and this is a little like a bit from the top of like a site that I, I my early, early, very, very first site uh, around 2008. And the, the byline that I used was concepts between clicks. I was an information architect and, you know, we're interested in, in obviously what's on the pages, but we're also really interested in the ideas that exist kind of in between stuff. So, yeah, betwixt and between. Um, if we look at plays, the, the three act structure in plays, the first act is establishing things and establishing characters. The second act um, uh, is where drama, the, 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 the challenge to the characters occur, and then there's resolution in the third act. But there's this idea in, in the middle bit is where the drama occurs. And there are examples in contemporary um, uh, drama as well. I mean, the three-act play structure has been around since ancient Greek times. But even you know, shows like The Wrestler and stuff use that structure. Going further back to um, ancient Greece, we, we find things like um, uh, the notion of uh, in medias res, where you almost begin with the second act, the idea of throwing the audience into a disarray. I'm a bit burpy because of this Red Bull. In design, um, <laughs> big burp. Um, in design, positive and negative space creates this kind of idea of the liminal, this, this thing of something being in between. 
Uh, and you can play with that. You can be really, really creative with, with, with the stuff in between. In architecture, there's a lovely example of it. It's used quite a lot in the foreshore um, of Cape Town. But intentionally building into urban planning and building into urban spaces, negative space, uh, to create the effect. So the, the, the lovely sense of, of openness that is created by the structure at the bottom left is, is intentional because they didn't want to go high. They wanted to create the sense of, of space, this leftover space. This is a concept artwork by, uh, uh, by my brother. He's busy painting um, uh, some of the walls of a building uh, down in Maboning, uh, which is in the east side of downtown Johannesburg. And if you look at the intersection, the dots, you actually start seeing black dots occurring uh, at that intersection. It's an optical illusion. And again, it's a lovely metaphor for, for intersection of people and things in the city um, of a game. What happens when, when you're in between spaces? We've seen uh, movies like The Terminal. What happens when you're, when you're, like, just the experience of being in airports is, is a very in-between experience. And um, in, in the movie The Terminal, Tom Hanks is, is stuck for an indefinite amount of time being between worlds. And it's this exploration of kind of what goes on in his mind, like being, being stuck there for so long. And in the Truman Show as well, there's this idea that fictional realities place one in between worlds and, and what happens when, when he finally emerges out of that, that, that space and his ship bashes into the wall at the, at the end of that, that reality, that, that in-between space. There are other issues like global citizenry versus um, nationhood. You know, to what extent, you know, we, 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 a lot of us are working internationally, taking on projects internationally, but we still have this kind of, you know, I'm, but I'm still a South African. There's, there's this kind of thing. Or immigrants. Immigrants have been described as existing in liminal spaces. This is a photograph of um, uh, Yeovil in Johannesburg, which has a massive community of foreign African nationals living there. Um, and there is this period that, of, of time where, where immigrants have to go through this process of, of uh, becoming into the new place. And the corollary, placemaking in cities, is, a, is an effort to actually create concrete spaces, well, excuse the pun, to create places in this larger mess space of metropoli that we see to, to ground people so that they don't have to be in a liminal space. So liminality uh, the, the actually comes from anthropology. Um, and... Um, and it's the quality of ambiguity or disorientation that occurs in the middle stages of rituals when participants no longer hold their pre-ritual status but have not yet begun the transition to the status they will hold when the ritual is complete. During the ritual's liminal stage, participants stand at the threshold between their previous way of structuring their identity, time, or community and a new way which the ritual establishes. So these, these concepts were, were, were first um, uh, written down by... Uh, a guy called Arnold Van Gennep in a book called Rites of Passage in 1909 where he coins the phrase liminality. And these ideas were taken a lot further by Victor Turner um, uh, in a paper that he wrote called Betwixt and Between the Liminal Periods in Rites of Passage, which was in 1967. But basically it's broken down into these kind of three stages. There's a, there's a preliminal stage, a liminal stage, and a post-liminal stage. And each one has associated rites, um, rites of passage. So in the first, there's a kind of a metaphorical death where, where you leave something behind, like that emotion that was evoked in the song that I was playing right up front. The middle stage, the, the liminal stage, is defined by two kind of characteristics. The one is that um, the, the kind of step process that you go through is a process. There, there, there is a kind of idea of what you should be going through. And secondly, that on some level it's facilitated. There, there, is, there is somebody that, that kind of holds your hand through that process. And the last is, is a kind of a reincorporation into society with a new identity as a, as a kind of a new being. So some of the characteristics of, of, of liminality are um, a sense of ambiguity and disorientation, um, the dissolution of identity and, and the rising of new perspectives. Through the social withdrawal is associated with this comes scrutiny um, of central values and axioms within which cultures occur. And the normal limits of thought, self-understanding self and behavior are undone. Um, and this, the, the kind of typical or conventional structure of society is temporarily suspended. More, more recent thinking around liminality also kind of breaks it down further. So you can go through a liminal experience as an individual or in a group or at the societal level, and that it can occur momentarily 
or over a period of time, or it can actually be an epoch, a, a life, a life, like lifetime of this. So in terms of the individual, like bar mitzvah is an example of, or bat mitzvah is an example of the individual going through a rite of passage where you begin the process as a boy or a girl and you, you come out the other end as a, as a man or a woman. You can also understand um, a death. Death can put one in, well, the death of somebody else can put you in a liminal space. Your death puts you in a totally different space. But what, what, what does happen is that the classic formations that, that we see in our family unit, we, our roles and our identities are very much made up of, of what our position in, is in the family, um, one's immediate family. When somebody dies, there is a moment, there's a period of time where that stuff gets shaken up and you can actually reform your identity. You can renegotiate those relationships. You can change your self-perceptions and things like that. And in Jungian psychology, um, the, the, the process of um, individuation and self-realization is, is often considered to be a process of going through um, a liminal experience. Um, I was in a six and a half year long Jungian liminal experience and it, it, it was costly. So in groups, um, uh, initiation ceremonies uh, uh, that, that we see in, in South Africa, graduation can even be considered as, as a, a kind of a group um, liminal experience. Or another example would be um, the pilgrimage to Mecca, where you know, people from different kind of castes of society, rich and poor, walk and pray side by side and have conversations which otherwise in regular day life they wouldn't ordinarily have. And for that period of time, um, people are in a kind of a liminal space. And businesses can kind of be thought about groups as well, like um, the period of time when, when Facebook was um, uh, going through the process of um, uh, their IPO. That was a liminal moment for the organization. And also the intersection of worlds. If we, if we think of like a phone, one of the reasons why, why phones are so difficult to design for um, is because of the intersection of all the different systems and ecosystems which layer up and make it extremely difficult for users as well. So you've got the phone in the center and then you've got third party apps and then you've got data providers and then you've got all of those guys putting different things in different clouds. And then you've got the manufacturer ecosystem and the telco ecosystem. And it's, it, you know, the user ends up in a liminal space. Like, where's my stuff? I actually don't know where my stuff is. I'm not sure which cloud it's in or, or who do I call for certain things, etc. So I think there's some really interesting parallels between design thinking and, um, and the, the liminal process. So where um, in liminality, we see the preliminal, the liminal, and the post-liminal phase. Um, in design thinking, we see deconstruction, synthesis, and reconstruction. Equally in design thinking, um, uh, some of the characteristics of design thinking are very, very similar to the characteristics of liminality. So an experience of ambiguity and disorientation when you are going through that process. Multidisciplinary teams working together as equals. The CEO next to the programmer, next to the project manager, next to the designer. And all those viewpoints are, are equal. Everybody's voice is, is equal. So the norms are left at the door. Um, acquiring new perspectives occurs as a result of this. And it's a space where you can and are meant to question central values, beliefs, and axioms so as to be able to innovate. The whole point is to be questioning all of these things. Design thinking, too, has a, has a predefined process. There, there, is a, there is a kind of a step process that you go through, and it's facilitated um, uh, by somebody, usually the designer. And interestingly, in the design, in the design thinking process, the, the the, the kind of researcher as, as ethnographer um, is, is said to kind of be in a liminal space where they have to suspend their ideas uh, so that they can try and see the world through somebody else's lens, and which comes along with all of its usual paradoxes. So, you know, the challenge of you can only see what you can see. Um, uh, that looks like a, a, a woman with a child in a pool or maybe the sea or something like that. Um, and you might not be like physically capable, you know, cognitively capable of, of imagining something larger, which is actually there. <coughs> At least it wasn't a burp. So um, uh, myself and my research partner, Terence Fenn, have written quite a lot about the relationship between information architecture, human-centered design, and design thinking. And it's not the thrust of this presentation. but. Um, if you are interested in, in, in those links, which, which will take this conversation to a kind of a, a deeper level, um, then you can go to our site and, and have a look at that and 
These are three papers in particular that I recommend if you're interested in it. This stuff will be on slideshow, so you can find it at another time. So liminality in society is really interesting. We've got two nice South African examples. The, the one was when we won the 1995 Rugby World Cup. There was, there was something that happened in our country. We, we, you know, it was just after 1994, and we desperately needed an event that, could, that we could all rally around, a moment where, where we could all be equal around the point of something else. And a lot of people describe that, that, that sense of, of, um, of coming together in sol solidarity that occurred after we won the Rugby World Cup. At that, and so for that, just for that moment, you know, as a whole society, we, we, we were in this kind of liminal space of, you know, we woke up the next morning and it was like, wow, maybe we can do the South Africa thing. Maybe, maybe, we can, maybe, we can, maybe this can work. At the period level, we've got something like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, you know, it's a, a two to three year time period where the whole country was, was set in this in-between space of um, what's going to come out the other end? You know, what, what will we be as a country um, once we know these truths? You know, we'll, we will be something different. You can't, you can't turn back from that knowledge when, once you've got it, once you've seen these things in different ways. And it was meant to be this, you know, um, a nationwide cathartic event of forgiving and, and letting go and moving on and coming out the end as something quite different. And I think at the societal level, we do see this um, uh, much more in diverse heterogeneous societies like our own um, and far less so in, in homogeneous societies. This image of, of um, a, a Muslim march in, in the United Kingdom, um, just a lovely example of, of the juxtaposition. So what about liminality as epoch? Um, at the individual level, you, you, you've got this idea, and perhaps it's a bit of a romantic idea, but as the artist as liminal outsider, as Picasso. Um, or uh, Disneyland, and, and the idea of um, like basically being, uh, since postmodernism, being, you know, the world has been in this, this liminal space because of postmodernism and the position that it put us in. And a lot of the efforts in the world are kind of like trying to crawl out of the liminal space that postmodernism left us in. Um, so at the epoch level, what happens is, is we see the incorpor incorporation and reproduction of liminality into structures, into the structures of our world, which is kind of paradoxical as well. And, and the internet is a, you know, is a major part of this, um, where it's put us. We, we exist in this space of constant change and, and constant evolution and constant disruption. So I want to talk a little bit about digital first. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a big topic um, uh, overseas. I think it's growing here. Some of the large organizations um, locally that I consult to are battling with this question. Um, and so I just want to be clear about what I mean by digital first. By digital first, I do not mean drive to web, and I don't mean biasing digital channels over other channels. What I mean um, is a kind of a critical mass or wave of digital pervading the real, pervading the way we normally have been doing things, particularly at the organizational level. And where the line between physical things, digital information, device, channel, and conceptual model, um, uh, you know, where does that begin and end? Okay, so this is, the, this is the thing I'm talking about when I'm talking about digital first. And the key factor is that, we, you know, is that we're living in the information age. Um, There's a pick from Ghost in the Shell. Um, so why is this happening now? Um, where businesses, organizations, governments, etc. now stand, where they now stand, is at the epoch level of liminality. Not a momentary or periodic thing. This is something which is going to continue. Um, we're in the midst of the information age, and yet many enterprises still operate with industrial structures and mindsets. And even companies that actually are in the service industry, like banks, for instance, they still treat accounts as products. They're not. They're services. They're not products. But they, but they still have a mindset which is, which is product-oriented. So where digital first emerged within IT and then kind of extended into marketing, it's now settling into the space of business. And, and, and it's one of the reasons why a lot of questions have started emerging around this issue of digital first. And I think it's important to note that you don't need to be e-commerce enabled to do business online. The growing expectation from both staff and customers is that business is online and digital in all respects. So while digital now warrants standing shoulder to shoulder with IT sales or marketing as a further organizational silo, its pervasiveness cries out not to be siloed at all. Um, it would suggest something more like a matrix structure integrated across silos. 
But besides which, it actually, it, you know, digital doesn't feel like an organizational function anyway. It's, a, it's kind of a more fundamental shift, a layer running, running horizontally through the hierarchy, slicing across silos and out the other side into society. So this, this, you know, when we talk about digital, it's kind of weird because, you know, in most enterprises, almost everything sits on a digital backbone everywhere. So we talk about bricks and mortar stores versus the internet, but, but they often share the same inventory system or processes that are running across channels. Um, you go into a shop and the, the, the guys are working off a computer because SAP has integrated the whole thing. Uh, whether it's done well is a different matter. Mm -hmm. But to what extent are, 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 are shops that we walk into, how digital are they? They're very digital. You know, they're extremely digital. Um, and also that information will flow uh, via digital channels whether we like it or not is the other thing. So, a few examples, um, um, which we'll all remember. In the early days, uh, security was this, was this big issue. So uh, companies started locking down, like you couldn't, you couldn't have disks. And then they would block the, uh, the USB ports. And, and it didn't make a difference, right? Information was taken out of the company one way or another anyway. And the burden of it became so um, great on organizations that, you know, the dominant current philosophy is, uh, you know what, just, just do what you want. And if you're stupid with the information, like, you need to take responsibility for it and we'll go to court or whatever. But like, you know what, just, just like be an adult. Um, another example would be social networking. So when social networking came around, um, uh, companies wanted to block Facebook and, and, and YouTube and all these things and Flickr and whatever else. And um, because you waste too much time at work if, you, if you're doing those things. And now people just do it on their phone, you know, so it, it finds a way. Or um, or well, the last example, which is you know the way companies in the early days viewed um, social networking channels, when when people posted negative stuff about an organisation, the first impulse was to like delete it, erase it, you know, let let let's sue that person. They can't say that publicly. How can they justify it? And now these channels have become service channels. Kind of like okay, great. Well, let let's let's actually use that as a way to address these issues. And. And, and the last point is, you know, is the challenge to put anything dash first or to join the dots? And, and, and another example uh, from banking would be, you know, kind of prior to the mid-90s, the, the, the majority of, of uh, uh, effort and money went into the branch experience. Yes, there were call centers and things like that, but it was very much the branch experience. And then the internet came around. And the banks were like, this is fantastic. We're going to divert all of our money into the internet because we can sell service and offer transactional stuff online. And it didn't work. Um, the only thing which really stuck was the transactional stuff. And so by the mid-2000s, there was this kind of pendulum swing back again into, into a series of, of um, very, very important uh, conferences that occurred in the mid-2000s where they kind of re-explored the, the, the channel um, environment. And, it, you know, there was a recognition that the branch remains the cornerstone of the relationship, but it needs to be integrated with a bunch of other channels and all the... Ch so, and then we get multi-channel integration, which has begin, become the hot topic. And you, South Africa is a little bit late to the party, even though we are probably one of the most progressive and innovative countries in terms of banking in the world. Do you know the ATM came from here? It was a South African invention. Um, uh, regardless of that, uh, so what we've seen are like all these new branches, like the branch of the future, and FMB's done like some really, really cool stuff and whatever else, but there's this new kind of generation of branches coming out. Um, but the point is, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't come to a realization like the branch remains cornerstone of the relationship, but how do we get things to integrate anyway if you're looking at things from like a dash first perspective? So I think it's much more about joining the dots and there's a lot, there's a lot more subtle strategic thinking that needs to be involved than saying anything should be dash first. I think that's very, very 101 thinking. So is the transformation businesses require just the operational integration of digital channels, or is there something more? Um, uh, a digital mindset implies the institutionalization of UX as well, and that, this has got far-reaching consequences, and we need to understand what those are. It's, more about, it's, more, it's about more than just building UX teams, conducting qualitative research and user testing. Uh, it involves C-level support, uh, deciding on the structure of the team and how it will be integrated, training and education, communication, operation, operationalizing these activities, developing success stories, outsourcing strategies, team growth strategies, et cetera, et cetera. And, and further, it's also about the organization embracing and living the, the principles that underlie UX design, which leads me to the point of, well, when we talk about UX, so we're not actually talking about design. We're not talking about making companies more 
designerly because the principles of UX are the principles of design. And the other question then becomes, well, how human-centered are the transformation activities of companies in realities? So in reality, so designing end-to-end -end customer journeys, rewriting processes, and then rolling out UX and related projects as these little kind of dots on a line, you know, is that, is that really kind of integrating human-centered thinking and design thinking into an organization? Which makes me want to talk about design and information, and liminality and information architecture. Um, is there another way to look at the shift required to both keep up and embrace the opportunities of, of digital? Uh, is there another way to look at the shift required? To, oh, I said that. Um, and should we not be exploring with organization what it needs to transform into the information age at a more fundamental level and to, fly, to find flow in this kind of epoch level liminality? So to this I say, enough already with the management consultants and the process re-engineering. And enough with customer research masquerading as customer centricity, with customer journeys masquerading as design, and with models of replication to increase profit margin. The underlying um, theoretical foundations of service design can be found in the writings, uh, largely in the writings by two guys, um, uh, Vargo and Lush. This is a really, really great book called The Service Dominant Logic of Marketing, which contains this thinking. Um, also, if you do a search on the service dominant logic of marketing, you'll find a website, and on it are all of their academic papers in chronological order, and you can literally see the progress of their thinking. And it's very, very profound stuff, and it's a lot deeper than um, the way service design presents um, its thinking uh, currently. In this book, they talk about eight fundamental principles of service dominant logic. The first is that the application of specialized skills and knowledge is the fundamental unit of exchange. And that indirect exchange masks the fundamental unit of exchange. In other words, products are just distribution mechanisms for the service that is actually being provided. Okay? And that goods are distribution mechanisms for service provision. And that knowledge is the fundamental force of competitive change. It follows then that all economies are service economies. And that the customer is always co-producer. So this is where we get that, that, ex that famous expression of... Um, <clears throat> Customers don't want a quarter-inch drill bit. They want a quarter-inch hole, right? This is, what, this is what is meant by it. So you need to ask a company the question, are you in the business of, of manufacturing and selling nails, or are you in the business of helping people put pictures on walls? And that's what's meant by the co-production of value, that the, that the customer, the user, the consumer, always fulfills that, that, that circle. And this is why the feedback loop is so important and things like that, and, and why... The, 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 the customer is the co-producer of value with the organization. And that it then follows that the enterprise can only make value propositions and that a service-centered view is customer-oriented and relational by necessity, right? Because of that closing of the loop. So what requires interrogation is the knowledge embedded in the organization. If this is the key thing um, and its products and how it continues to morph through the co-production of value with users within a shifting marketplace and world. And then the question becomes, how do we interrogate knowledge at the institutional level? And I think that information architecture helps us to do this. So Nathan Shedroff's continuum of understanding is, is helpful here to, to, uh, to allow me to explain what I, I think IA can do. Um, his continuum of understanding, there's a theory around this, but in simple form, it kind of moves from, you know, you've got data and then information, knowledge and wisdom. This space, data and information, is the space that information architects have been operating in always, um, and not just in a technical sense, um, in, in any sense. It's, a, it's about taking data, making sense of what's going on through looking at data, and turning it into information, something that can be consumed, interpreted, understood, discussed, critiqued, whatever, as a stepping stone and move into um, a space of knowledge. And if we're doing that to continue it, into the space of knowledge, well then all of a sudden we're doing a very, very interesting thing and a very powerful thing. Um, so how can we take our knowledge of working with information to co-produce value with organizations by exposing and generating that knowledge? And obviously there's some implications for how we think of information architecture these days as a result of this. Number one, a channel agnostic view is required. 
Number two, internally and externally facing dona domains need to be conceptually integrated. We need to understand this as, a, as one continuous thing, not, not as the silos. That organization marketplace and the interlocking systems, like in that drawing I did of, of the, the phone, are the space of investigation. And that we need to develop value propositions based on acquired knowledge. So it's very much the view of the information architect as designer, as management consultant, as anthropologist, and as product manager. So to wrap up, um, liminal space is a creative space. IA can be used to make sense of it. Information can be used to reconstruct out of liminality. IA can generate new knowledge. And hybrid roles could transform the value on offer from IA. And that's it. That was quite, uh, that was quick. Because we've got quite a lot of time, don't we? Luke, we're not going to take lunch again, but we can do a quick Q&A. Um, we've got about 10 minutes before Adrian steps on, onto the podium. Does anybody please have questions for Jason? Yeah. Cool. What's up? Thanks, Jason. That was fantastic. Really good. Um, so you touched on a, a couple of really relevant topics, um, especially in how organizations see themselves as living organizations and uh, the stuff that makes the, the dynamic and the, and the stuff between people. Um, you know, my mind's racing at the moment, but um, I'm curious to see you mentioned an anthropologist in there. And, um, you know, that's place where you try to understand an organization and its design, but also behavior and how people again, see the world and operate in dynamics between people. Do you think um, organizations need to, how do you in start incorporating that kind of insight and understanding and patterns into organizations and how they function? I mean, I, I, I could come up with a bunch of, of suggestions, but you know, I haven't necessarily done this because of point of conversation. I don't think anybody's really done this. I mean, <coughs> somebody in one of the talks yesterday, um, uh, the um, gov.uk guys, I mean, they're doing some, some very interesting digital first type stuff. Um, but, but nobody's got it right and, and, and everyone's just blundering through. But to be quite honest, I, I don't know. I mean, my first thought actually when, when you were talking was, um, that, that HR actually is, is a kind of a function which is just really weird in its current form and is so much opportunity, but it really needs to be exploded. It, it's, not a, it's not a thing which sits on the side or, or, or some kind of weird, you know, just like another silo. I mean, it's something that needs to be peppered in a much more interesting matrix-oriented way. I mean, they, they, they have the same issue that, that design has, um, but, but I don't really know, sorry. <laughs> 